Folks, if everyone could grab a seat, we'd like to start. I'm not a big fan of JST. I like to just roll when the time tells us to roll. Yes, Jewish standard time. Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry for those for those who are uninitiated. Um, also, I, I see some of you already have. We are going to be conducting questions in a specific kind of way. If you can write your questions on cards and give them to Rabbi Spizer or to Hannah Barg, our NIF uh, local uh, person, and um, they will take those and curate them because I guarantee you, many of you will have similar questions and we'd like to provide as much of an opportunity to cover as much ground as possible and we have found that this is a good way to do it. So, good evening, everyone. Thank you. You know, it could be a little responsive here. That's fine. Uh, it is wonderful to have all of you here this evening for what promises to be really a very special and scintillating event. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, the adage that timing is everything and sometimes it's better to be lucky than to be smart. Uh, certainly is at play this evening. Who would have known that when we scheduled this event months and months and months ago, that uh, Israel would not only be, the, the situation, the Matzav in Israel would not only be something that is central on our minds and in our hearts, but also something that really is um, impacting the globe, impacting everyone. We are all looking at Israel not only in and of itself as a Jewish state, but particularly what it reflects in terms of the larger global conflict between the values of liberal democracy and encroaching authoritarianism, something that's happening not just in Israel, but obviously around the world. Uh, my name is Rabbi Daniel Wiener. I am one of the rabbis here at Temple to Her Sinai. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome members of the community to this very special opportunity to hear from the director of the New Israel Fund, the executive director of the New Israel Fund, Daniel Sokach. Um, I wanna start by thanking so many of our community partners who partner with Temple to Her Sinai and New Israel Fund for this event. Temple Beth Am, Congregation Beth Shalom, Beit Olive Meditative Synagogue, the Jewish Community Relations Council, Kadima Reconstructionist Community, Kavanaugh Cooperative, Kol HaNishama, and of course, the New Israel Fund. Um, Obviously, as I mentioned, tongue in cheek at the beginning, this is um, really a critical time in uh, many ways, the history of world civilization, but particularly the history of the state of Israel. The new extremist government is indeed, I don't think it's overstating it to say it is waging war on the values we hold most dear, democracy, equality, and justice. And since the election in November, it seems like a lifetime ago, we've seen particularly just in the last 48 hours, Israelis stepping up and taking to the streets every week to push back against anti-democratic policies. And so it is particularly a pleasure uh, to welcome and to introduce our speaker this evening. Daniel Sokach has served as the CEO of the New Israel Fund since 2009. During the past decade of extraordinary challenges, NIF has risen to, risen to new heights as the great defender of justice, democracy, and equality in Israel. Before joining NIF, Daniel served as the executive director of the Jewish Community Federation of San Francisco, the Peninsula, Marin, and Sonoma counties. Prior to his tenure at Federation, he was founding executive director of the Progressive Jewish Alliance, now Ben the Ark. He has contributed articles to leading newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, Washington Post, the Forward Haaretz, and is the author of the book, which hopefully is in your hands, if not in your hearts, and if you need it, it's out there. Can we talk about Israel, a guide for the curious, confused, and conflicted? Let us please welcome Daniel Sokach. Thank you. So what's new? <laughs> Nothing. Um, I certainly want to get to the book because that's all obviously what, uh, what authors and your publisher really wants us to do. But before we get to the book, um, the current and unprecedented situation in Israel is certainly foremost on our minds. Um, can you comment a bit on it? And in particular, I don't know if you've caught this in the book for those who read it, we talked about it last week. 
you have uh, in a section talking about um, Arab-Israeli politicians, like uh, the Knesset member Ayman Ode's quote, which to me was just incredibly prescient. He said, quote, the day in which hundreds of thousands of Hundreds of thousands fill the streets, crying out in one voice in two languages, democracy for all. This will be the first day of the joint future we build. He clearly was talking about that with the hopes of a, a vision for Arab and Israeli embrace of democracy and, and treat it equally within that democratic uh, uh, scenario. But the, the, his vision of crying in the streets for democracy, I mean, he's almost a Navi, almost a prophet. Tell us a little bit about kind of your impressions and, and what you're hearing on the ground, and you've spent some time amongst 200,000 of your closest friends on the streets of Tel Aviv. Tell us a little bit about your impressions of what's been going on. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. It's really great to see all of you here tonight. Um, <laughs> it's quite a moment uh, to be having this conversation. And, um, you know, I'm often asked in book talks, what do you wish you had uh, included in the book? And the answer is pretty obvious now, and that is, you know, the last 24 hours. <laughs> um, so Ayman Oda is a really interesting guy uh, because he is the leader of one of the political parties in Israel, the, what's known as the Joint List, which is a, a combination. It's a mostly Arab, but not totally Arab political party um, that is sort of built. It was a coalition of parties um, built around the central um, party of Hadash, which is the old... Israeli Communist Party. It's no longer a Communist Party, and some other smaller Arab factions. So in a way, it was at its heyday kind of the, the Arab Jewish political party that, that gave sort of rise to the vision that you described that, that, that um, I quoted in the book. And interestingly, at a time when uh, Arab citizens of Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, for a series of reasons that may at first seem complicated or, or surprising, but when you think about it, it kind of makes sense, when, you, when you, 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 you realize that they have not shown up in great numbers to these protests. And, and the reason for that is, is several fold. First, as one of uh, my Palestinian Israeli board members said to me, um, she lives in Nazareth. By the way, this, this is a, a woman who is a poster child for, for every version, of, every vision of Israel except the one of the current coalition, right? Um, so every past right-wing coalition would have loved her. She and her husband are, are, are Christian Arab citizens of Israel. They would identify, they would call themselves Palestinian citizens of Israel, as many Arab citizens would. They um, started a high-tech company in Nazareth, which it, it's kind of incredible. They make a stent for brain surgery that nobody else makes in the world. They've been wildly successful. They have a, uh, operations in Atlanta and around the world. And she said to me... Uh, I, I'm too frightened to put my kids into the car and go into the heart of Tel Aviv. A younger board member, also an Arab citizen of Israel, she said, look, she said, I think it's really important what's happening. And she herself, by the way, does go to protest from her, she's a Bedouin woman, a doctor from her home in the south of Israel. But she says, you have to understand this is new to Jewish Israelis who for the first time feel that they are being oppressed, who for the first time feel that the country doesn't want them, this, or the, rather the coalition doesn't want them. And she said, that's how we felt our whole lives. So, so those are powerful things and hard things for all of us to hear. And, and I would add a third factor, which is that there has been a, um, an explicit intention on the part of some of the mainstream organizers of the protest to be as inclusive as possible for the Jewish community of Israel so they don't want to see Palestinian flags being flown. And there's, there seems to be an explicit desire to avoid talking about the occupation. Correct. In fact, speakers on the main stage in Tel Aviv are instructed, don't mention the word occupation. Yeah. So all of this is complicated. And here comes Ayman Oda, who, as you can tell from my description of him in the book, a lot of people are angry at him because the joint list sort of split up and he couldn't hold it together, and that's one of the many reasons Netanyahu was able to succeed. But um, th he is an extraordinary guy. And uh, by the way, there's, in addition to, this is exactly what authors shouldn't do, but I'm gonna do it. In addition to my book, which you should all read, 
There's an excellent profile of him for a few, from a few years ago in The New Yorker, David Remnick. NIF introduced I'm an Oda to David Remnick, and he wrote a, an amazing profile of him. So if you just Google uh, in The New Yorker, I'm an Oda, you'll, you'll read this profile. So into this mix, one of the two or three most important Arab Israeli leaders comes out this week and says, we should be at the protests. Mm. As hard as it is, as much as he recognizes and feels and agrees with the three things, as, because he says, and this is just like the most NIF-y thing I could imagine, right? <laughs> he says, part of our job is to show up because it will be so much worse if this coup succeeds. And also, we need by our presence to show our fellow citizens that we are here too, and we have a stake here too, and you can't ignore us, and you can't ignore our pain, and you can't ignore the way Arab citizens are treated, and you most of all can't ignore the occupation, which is the engine of this attack on democracy in many ways. Now, I, some young people that, that have been recently interviewed in the New York Times or whatever um, in Israel have said, look, we who are young and progressive, um, you know, we've checked out on politics for a long time. And this is maybe finally the wake-up call to get us involved. David Grossman in The Atlantic said something similarly, saying, even though we can't talk about the occupation from the stage, perhaps this um, dramatic moment will be what it takes to kind of raise people's awareness to things like the occupation and, and beyond. Well, look, I don't want to overstate the case, right? But um, <clears throat> in addition to people like like Ayman Oda and, and David Grossman and NIF and the organizations we support trying to draw these connections and make these connections. Something quite extraordinary happened. Uh, in, in, this, this happened a long time ago, so you might not remember it. It was a week and a half ago. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the Israeli police, um, under the direct orders of Itamar ben Gvir, the Minister for National Security, who had himself ordered the Tel Aviv police chief fired, which the police chief and the national police had done, and then he reinstated him afterwards. But in that window, Ben Gvir went to the, the police sort of headquarters looking at the protests in, 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 uh, in Tel Aviv, and he was giving orders about where you should start using fire hoses. Now, that is not something that has happened with a lot of secular liberal Jewish protests in the state of Israel, hmm. that the cops do a cavalry charge or turn fire hoses. But when they turned the fire hoses on those protesters, something rather extraordinary happened because thousands of them began chanting to the police, Efo Haitem Behuara. Yeah. And that means, where were you in Hawara? And Hawara is the Palestinian village in the West Bank that uh, after two Israelis uh, settlers were shot dead uh, in a terror attack in the West Bank, 400 settlers descended on the community at, murdered a resident and burned buildings and cars and terrorized people for hours before the Israeli police finally showed up. Virtually a pogrom. Israeli leaders called it a pogrom. So it was a, a pretty extraordinary moment when protesters sort of spontaneously made that connection that as connection. well. Wonderful. All right, let's get to the book. Two <laughs> years ago, you wrote this book. Um, Clearly, <laughs> there are many things you could have added. Uh, there, a lifetime has happened in those two years. But what was the original impetus and what were you hoping to achieve with this book? Because one of the things I found really most compelling is that the first half is really an incredibly comprehensive and in-depth primer of kind of <laughs> not just the last couple thousand years, but really the last hundred years or so in the development of Zionism and the founding of the State of Israel. And the second half, you really dive into some of the most controversial elements. But tell us a little bit about what was the impetus and how you uh, came to structure the book the way that you have. Sure. Um, first of all, the book gets you right up to uh, the Change Coalition, as it was called in Israel. So even though, again, that's ancient history, it, it, it's, it's, still, <laughs> it's still somewhat relevant. So look, I, I um, let's see. I have been working in the field that we all, that we work in um, for 23 years now. And over that period of time, I have watched and, and listened as the conversation about Israel in America and also in Israel and beyond has become more and more vituperative, more and more vicious, more and more emotional, and less and less tethered to actual facts, empathy, and understanding, right? It's become almost a Rorschach test 
for how you feel about the world. And that's been very distressing to me for a number of reasons, right? I, I fell in love with this place when I was 16 years old and I've devoted my career to working one way or the other to sort of help Israelis, to support Israelis trying to realize a vision of that country that would make them and, and certainly me and many of us proud. And for sure, um, you know, one of the great uh, realities of the American Jewish community in the years since World War II is that we've predicated identity, Jewish identity and communal identity in no small part on our relationship to Israel and our understanding of Israel and or our understanding of what we think Israel is. And that, that conversation, it seemed to me, was going off the rails and it was increasingly being defined by camp, several camps, right? One of them is what I call the Israel Always Right crowd, which unfortunately too many institutions, I believe, in my Jewish community, in our Jewish community, uh, tend to line up with, and also other parts of the community, uh, the American community, and the Israel Always Wrong crowd, right? That the, the crowd that believes that there's like no worse state actor, that the answer to the question of what's wrong with the world is Israel. And um, there's a third camp, and that's the one that I'm really concerned about, because there's not a lot you can do with those camps, and that's not who I wrote the book for, but the third camp are the people who are saying, I'm out, I'm walking away. Now, I have two kids, they're 18 and 20, and if their dad wasn't the CEO of the New Israel Fund, they would be in the camp of people who say, I'm walking away. I have no interest in this conversation. Uh, I don't wanna see people trying to defend what is clearly a country that is doing some things I don't agree with, and I don't wanna see people who are conflating Jews and Israel or saying that Israel and Jews are worse than every other people, I'm out. And it seemed to me that, um, look, there are a lot of books about Israel out there, um, but they fall largely into two big groups, right? On the one hand, you've got um, what I, we were talking about one of these books earlier, books that I think of as what we called in law school advocacy pieces, right? Those are books that are written to promote uh, sympathy or empathy for one side of the story, by the way. Most of us in this room know that there are not two sides to this story because if you are a part of the Jewish community and you're, you're in this room, then you know there is no monolithic Jewish communal opinion when it comes to Israel and its conflict with the Palestinians. And the same is true of the other side or sides to the conflict, but for the sake of simplicity, right? These are books that are really meant to, to, to build support. And sometimes they're very honest about what their intention is. I remember Alan Dershowitz years ago, years ago wrote a book called The Case the for case Israel. For Israel. Hey, like, there you go. Yeah. Um, but there are other books that are more subtle and sometimes even camouflage. And I had no interest in books like that. Because I do have a position, I have an agenda, but that agenda is sort of radical empathy, compassion, and an acceptance of the legitimacy of both stories and both people's claims to this place. How rare at this time of everything being binary and polarized that you, and especially the Jewish people, we kind of invented the notion of machloket l'shem shemayim, right. the idea of, of righteous, thoughtful, constructive dialogue and debate. And the fact that now we have succumbed to the greater kind of societal illness of everything being so polarized and binary, but particularly about something as important as Israel, is heartbreaking in totally. so many ways. So I, and, and by the way, not just us, you're absolutely right but also non-Jews who connect to this question uh, of Israel. Uh, evangelical dispensationalist Christians, liberal Christians, uh, m American Muslims, lots of people feel that they have to choose one of those two sides, and I reject that false dichotomy. The, the second group of books is much more interesting, and you have them on the shelves of your study, and I have them on the shelves of my office, and those are books about Israel, often excellent, that are by and for scholars, experts, specialists, and they're not, what they suffer from is uh, an accessibility issue, right? They're not accessible. But there's a third category of books, and that's what I kind of wanted to humbly see if I could contribute to. And those are books that for me as a younger guy were um, the navigational devices, the, the literary GPS devices <laughs> that helped me understand and guide me through um, an understanding of Israel and then later of the conflict. And those are books like, um, well, you mentioned David Grossman. So he wrote a book called, uh, David Grossman is a brilliant Israeli novelist who also writes brilliant nonfiction and uh, who spoke the other day at one of the big protests. And Grossman wrote a book uh, on the 
uh, he wrote it on the eve of the first intifada, or Palestinian uprising in the occupied territories. The, the, the English translation was called The Yellow Wind. And in it, he talks to Palestinians, and, and, and he says, this is going to explode because of the way we are treating them. And of course, that came to pass. He wrote another book years later called, uh, in English, Sleeping on a Wire, which were conversations with uh, Arab citizens of Israel. And those books had a huge impact on me, certainly uh, even earlier, From Beirut to Jerusalem by Tom Friedman. Um, a lot of us have read it. Some people roll their eyes. But when he wrote that book, it was a profoundly important book for me because it, 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 it gave me sort of a sense that some kid from the Midwest, he was from Minneapolis, I'm from Cincinnati, right, could, could, could sort of figure out a way to engage with this. And then the most important one of all for me was uh, the late great uh, and former international council member of the New Israel Fund, Amos Oz's book, again in English, called In the Land of Israel, which he wrote in 1982. And he kind of went up and down the length uh, and breadth of the land to the West Bank, to Gaza, within Israel proper, and he talked to everyone. And he paints a picture of a country that is on the brink of some huge uh, seismic changes all of which came to pass. And these books sort of, and then later I read books by Palestinian authors that helped me and by other Americans and, and Europeans who were writing. But those books were like seminal aids for me to figure this stuff out. And I wanted to see if I could contribute something for a new generation of uh, mostly English speaking uh, people, not only Jews, not only young people, but also young people and Jews who were trying to wrestle with this. Incidentally, it's been translated into Portuguese, Japanese, Heartbreakingly, there is a Ukrainian edition, but I got a letter from them a year ago saying they'd had to delay publication, understandably. Um, but not Hebrew. Oh, really? No, yeah. nothing in Hebrew. Not Hebrew. Yeah. French, Spanish, it's all out there. But, uh, but, I, but I hoped that this book could, could that's a long answer to your simple question no, about no, why well, I wrote the book. That's what we're here for, absolutely. Um, let's dive in a little bit. Um, some things that kind of uh, uh, really stuck out to me. One of the most evocative statements in your book occurs early on in the first half, um, which is really, as I said, a comprehensive overview. When asked about whether you are a Zionist or not, you state, quote, to ask the question now seems a bit strange. The goal of Zionism, the idea that the Jewish people are entitled to self-determination in their ancient homeland of Israel, was realized the day in May 1948 when Israel was established. So to ask if someone identifies as a Zionist or anti-Zionist is a bit anachronistic, kind of like asking if they are pro-union or pro-Confederacy, 150 years after the end of the Civil War. Israel is a reality, so asking about someone's stance on the 19th century movement that intended to create it doesn't seem particularly relevant. My question is, isn't this concept of Zionism, especially when Jewish self-determination, I think in many ways Israel is threatened, it continues to be threatened, is something that has been realized but is, I think, in some ways tenuous, and it's a continuous battle. And conversely, though, doesn't dismissing Zionism as an anachronistic 19th century relic, doesn't that run perilously close to what virulent anti-Zionists say, that Israel is a settler colonialist throwback to 19th century European nationalism? So my answer to your question would be no. <laughs> um, and why? <laughs> because, because what I'm really arguing here is, is you know, I could, have, I could have called that section, I had several sections of the book, and I, I do use it, as you know, at one point. I, I thought about calling that little section what we talk about when we talk about Zionism. Mm. I ended up using it for another thing in the book, but, there, but it's a theme because one of the things that I encounter in my work and I try to really unpack in the book is the way in which, I used the term Rorschach's test earlier, um, we're often talking past each other about terms that we think we agree on. And there's no better example of that than the term Zionist, right? Because when someone asks me, are you a Zionist, or are you an anti-Zionist, or accuses me, not just me, you, anyone, of being a Zionist or an anti-Zionist, they're not really asking what I think about a 19th century movement um, and the idea behind the movement dedicated to self-determination for the Jewish people. Right, they're asking me other questions. And my argument, my plea in the book, which by the way, I have lost the argument, I understand that, is that <laughs> we should try to talk about what we're really talking about. 
So what I say to people when they ask me that question, and by the way, the same question has a different inflection depending on who's asking. It can be asked hostily, suspiciously, proudly. What I really want to say, what I try to say, what I try to say is what do you actually want to know, right? Do you want to know if I think Israel has a right to exist? Then I do. I, the answer is yes, I do. Do you want to know if I think the Jewish people are entitled, like every other people, um, to some modicum of safety, self-determination, and, and, and the ability to live in peace and quiet? I do. Are you asking me if I think that Israel uh, is treating its Arab citizens in a way that renders them effectively, in reality, de, de facto second-class citizens in some respects? I do. Are you asking me if I think that an endless, now 56-year occupation of the West Bank is incompatible with any real notion of real democracy? I do, right? So ask me to, not you, Rabbi, but, but, but when we have these conversations, I always try to turn back to the people. Uh, I say, ask me what you really want to know, or for that matter, define what you mean when you say, are you a Zionist That's or an anti-Zionist? That's the better question. And uh, it is indeed the better question. Yeah. Um, um, but the first one's more satisfying. I um, understand. I understand. But you know, I, I had I, I had I had lunch with the the um, the dean of a of a major public California law school that has recently been involved in what I like to think of as the Israel Wars or hmm. the Jewish Wars, hmm. right? Which one could that be? And okay. and and he and I he's an NIF supporter, and and you know at his law school. Uh, nine student organizations out of 120 had said that Zionist speakers couldn't address the group. And so we were talking about this, and he said, you know, they don't even want to talk to me. They would never let you come. I said, you know, by that definition of Zionist, they wouldn't let Barack Obama or Bernie Sanders or AOC come and talk. He said, oh, absolutely, although they don't know what that, def they don't have the definition of Zionist. They just, they just say it, and they mean it to, to represent a set of things that, that, that are amorphous, right? That have to do with Israel's current government and its policy or maybe support for Israel at all, but they haven't done the hard work of thinking through what they mean. They just said the Z word. And then we paused and he looked at me and he said, of course, International Hillel has had the opposite rule in place for a decade. That's right. Where if you are an anti-Zionist speaker, you are not welcome to speak at a Hillel. So I would argue to those student organizations at Bolt, right? And I would argue to Hillel, just say what you mean, unpack what you're talking about. You might find, if you do that, that you're actually, you are uncomfortable with the limitations that you've put on yourself, right? Like, let's really look at what you mean. Those are slogans, and we don't even have the same definition of what those slogans are. So I'm a champion for saying, what do you mean? I absolutely agree with the idea that, that we need to unpack that word. I guess my greatest fear is that Zionism is gonna go the way of the word liberal, in the sense that we are allowing those who have a denigrating view of it to define it and to make it radioactive and to make it toxic. And I don't want to let them do that. No, I want I'm, to be able to reclaim that for, for ourselves and define it for ourselves. I'm with you, and I don't want to let, you know, I don't want to let Itamar Ben Gvir and, and Betzalel Smotrich and the Jewish Defense League uh, and the Kohelet Forum. I don't want them to have the That's rights right. to Zionism. That's right. Um, we may be too late, but, but, uh, but I'm with you. No, very good. Um, so some, I want to ask something uh, that was something you glancingly talked about, one of the two A words yeah. uh, in that section. Um, we have had here in our community uh, in the last couple months uh, quite a conflict about IRA. I heard a little bit about Yeah, that. the King County Council wanted to uh, share an innocuous, a pretty innocuous benign proclamation, as they do to support so many other marginalized communities, for the Jewish community. And in doing so, they wanted to, through the work of American Jewish Committee and some other organizations, they wanted to make reference to IRA's definition of anti-Semitism. And as you know, that is you know, quite controversial, even though IRA itself says very explicitly that uh, criticism of Israel is not de facto anti-Semitism, that criticism of Israel is absolutely not anti-Semitism, that it can be you know, much more encompassing. Um, you, you reference the two most controversial elements, supposedly, uh, for IRA, one having to be with the denial of Jewish self-determination and classifying uh, race, uh, Zionism, uh, excuse me, Zionism and racism as a kind of anti-Semitism, and applying a double standard to Israel. Um, I understand that IRA has been tainted 
by Trump, especially with the Title VI and the, and the college campus uh, issues. But as Shakespeare wonderfully taught us in The Merchant of Venice, uh, even the devil can quote the scriptures. Do we want to allow the fact that it's been tainted to dismiss what I think and what many think to be an imperfect but still a very apt and usable working definition of anti-Semitism just because it talks about Israel in, in a couple of its examples and defining examples? Um, first of all, it's interesting because there's like a parallel to this question to the last topic we talked about. Yeah. Do, do we want to surrender to people who would pervert those things, right? Um, tools that we think might, or labels that we think might be useful. That's Just, right. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, look, I feel like I'm being plunged right in the middle of a very Seattle, uh, and, I, and in my meetings with folks today, I have heard a bit about this. He, here's what I would say. Um, as, and by the way, for those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, um, IRA is the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, is that the right acronym? Um, which, which put forth a definition of anti-Semitism. Right, and the idea, the, the person who framed this explicitly has said, I never intended this to be adopted for policy reasons and, or, or, or legal reasons, but of course that's exactly what has happened. Um, and, and so I'm just giving you my opinion, and NIF's position is, is that IRA should not be adopted for policy, um, uh, which is what Ken Stern, I think, is the name of the author of IRA, yeah. what, 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 what he said. The, the, the other two authors repudiated him, by the way, but okay. So yeah. like I said, yeah. I don't want to get too much I'm into, just saying, into, into I'm your just hometown saying. Uh, yeah. Yeah, conflict yeah, yeah, yeah. here. Yeah. But the, the, the problems, as the rabbi said, with IRA that many of us had, and I'm one of those people, as I write in the book, are not with the definition itself, but rather the working examples, as they're called, which are meant to be sort of um, situ, like they're scenarios at which, in which this could be applied. And I don't think it's a leap at all to feel that people could and would use uh, those working examples to tar certain criticism of Israel as anti-Semitism. And you can imagine what it's like to be painted with that brush, right? In academia, uh, especially if, let's say you're a Palestinian American and you know, we, we have a Palestinian American congresswoman from Michigan. And why in the world would she say that she, you know, for her to say, I don't think Israel should exist as a state that privileges Jews. I think it should be a democratic state for all of its people. And I think that it shouldn't exist as a state that privileges one people over the other. You could argue that under IRA, that's an anti-Semitic statement, but she's a Palestinian. What, there's, there's not a single Palestinian that you will find, including Arab citizens of Israel who are proud, loyal citizens who wouldn't rather just be completely equal to their Jewish brothers and sisters, right? So because of that complexity and because it is being adopted, um, you know, as policy, that's I think where the where the problem lies, and I'll I'll just give you the absurd example, which which is real and happened once again last week, when a high-ranking uh, Likud member of Knesset accused one of NIF's grantees, an organization that is very controversial in Israel, um, and you'll understand why when I tell you who they are. They're called Breaking the Silence, mm -hmm. and they are they are elite combat veterans. Uh, including members of my family who testified to them, uh, who, who, who testify and say, when I was serving in the West Bank, these are the things I was ordered to do and that I did. And these things are violative of IDF norms. They're often violative of rules of war and international law. Now, you can imagine why they elicit such outrage among some quarters in Israel, because these are like literally the the best and brightest, the apple of the eye of Israeli society. They come from combat units. They come from their officers. They're people who are who are sort of you know um, exemplary, and it's horrifying. And you know what they say is, look, our job is just to hold up a mirror to you, Israeli, our parents and our society, and say this is what we were ordered to do in the name of this occupation. You do what you want with that, but we're going to tell you what we were told to do. This Likud high-ranking member of the current governing coalition said last week that under IRA, breaking the silence should be held as an anti-Semitic organization and shut down by the government of Israel. That, for me, is the danger of IRA. So for me, and this is you know, my opinion, uh, there's another, uh, in response to the arguments around IRA, a group of scholars uh, wrote something, as you know, called the Jerusalem Declaration. And to my mind, that's like a version of IRA that, that learned from what happened when those working examples got, got um, digested and, and utilized. So again, uh, for me, um, the, the, 
because you don't have to only have one, because people learned and they wrote something that I think is better, right? That, my, you know, again, we don't take a position on whether IRA is good or bad or whatever. We just say it shouldn't be adopted as policy or law or guidelines to shut down, I mean, human rights, Jewish human rights organizations, again, at the height of absurdity. But those, I think, illustrations show why it's problematic and why I think things like the Jerusalem Declaration are iteratively kind of the smarter next step, which do the thing that so many of us want to do. And what I actually think we need to do in this country at a time of rising anti-Semitism and, and confusion around anti-Semitism. So I, 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 like, I'm in no way dismissing the problem. I just say, I just feel we, should, we, we, we are able to come up with better, um, more precise solutions to it. Yeah. Now, listen, I think I don't want to go too far down the field on this. It, it's a working I don't even have any more I can say. About no, it's a working <laughs> definition. And the Jerusalem Declaration has some pretty significant drawbacks as well. But for another conversation. So back to the book. Your book describes the difficult challenges for peace, civil rights, and religious pluralism in Israel, which is the bread and butter of NIF, obviously, including what you describe as a, demo, a democracy recession. Um, and that was clearly well before the current situation that we're in. One would say we're in a democracy depression now in Israel. What can we learn from your book to make sense of what's happening today? Can I just say, um, I, I said this to some of you earlier, this is hard to get our heads around, I think, right now, because it feels, if you care about this place, and all of you who are in this room, I think, care about this place, or at least you're interested in it, and, and, and most of us care desperately about it, um, <laughs> what is not easily translated back here right now, um, we, we're get it, we, we are able to understand what is getting translated is that, and I think all of this is true, Israel is on the brink, right? Israel is at in my opinion, the most important juncture of its history, where it, where, where it, and, and its democracy really is um, threatened in a profound way, that's coming through the apocalyptic nature. When the president of Israel says we're on the brink of civil war, president of Israel is a, is a, is a, is a good, calm guy, right? There's a lot of criticisms of him, but that's not, one of them is not that he's a hysteric. He's not a bomb thrower, he's for not sure. A bomb he is pretty moderate. When, when yes. he says we are on the brink of civil war, you have to take him seriously. Yeah. What doesn't get, tran get translated, because you said, right, recession to depression, something amazing happened in Israel. Something amazing, flawed for all the reasons that we discussed earlier with, with Ayman Oda and who's coming out and what the limits are. But uh, I'm going to propose to you, and some of you will say I'm being Pollyannish, but I'm not, right? D d this is, we're by no means in the clear here, people, right? This is not over. But we, writ large, the folks on the ground in Israel and those of us who support them here, we won the first round, right? He backed down. This coalition could not do what it set out to do, even though it had a clear majority in the parliament. They could not do it. Right? Israel realized Israelis, regular Israelis, in a way that, that Hungarians didn't and Poles didn't, certainly Russians didn't, right? Maybe Brazilians did a little bit, maybe yeah. we did a little bit, but they did there in a way more powerful than any place I've ever seen in any, any democracy, flawed or otherwise. They realized, oh, what you're trying to do is use your, a democratic election to, to change us into a non-democracy, and that's illegitimate. That's not what you get to do. That is a total break of the social contract. And without any of the things that saved our republic, however, you know, however uh, uh, tenuously, right? Without, without federalism, without two houses of the legislature, um, without any of that. Constitution. Without, without a written constitution, for God's sakes, and a bill of rights. Without any of that, just with their feet, hundreds of thousands of Israelis went and they stopped it. They stopped the coup. So I just want us to say, for like, I, I hope we can acknowledge that, that just now, as of yesterday, that was a big win for people who don't want to see Israel go the way of Hungary or Poland. A big, big win. So we should take pride in it, and we should be proud of the Israelis uh, who, who, who showed up, and all of us who showed up here, we should feel good about that. So having said that... <laughs> um, yeah, that's yeah, worthy. Yeah, come, come on. on. We can... How often do we get to do that in this business, right? So what I, what I hope the book can illustrate is how we got to this place. And you mentioned the democracy recession, and, and that's a term that was coined by a political scientist uh, about someplace other than Israel, but, but in 2010, when NIF and our human rights organizations were first targeted by 
a previous iteration of the Netanyahu administration and its ultra right wing, they call them in my business, gongos, government organized NGOs. They're, they're not real NGOs. Um, AstroTurf. They, yeah, right, right, yeah, that's right. And uh, you know, we have them here and they have them there. And when one of them called very cynically, Im Tirtzu, which means if you will it, which is a play on the, on the great motto of Theodor Herzl, if you will it, it is no dream. Uh, a group called Im Tirtzu, which said it was a student organization, and you know, w uh, by the way, years later it was sued successfully in Jerusalem court. Uh, um, well, rather, they they launched a defamation suit against a group of Israeli activists who uh, had a Facebook page that was called Im Tirtzu is a fascist organization, <laughs> and and the judgment the judgment was ultimately voided. They settled for other reasons, but but the original the initial judgment, the judge, a religious Israeli, uh, found. Uh, it, it, that their, li their libel suit failed because uh, the other side was able to present evidence that, in fact, they did have characteristics of a fascist organization. Yes. So that's who was coming at us then, yeah. right? And, and, and again, it's hard for me to imagine that people could read this book today and not see that what I lay out there, what happened in Israel uh, for the last 14 years was a roadmap of where things were going here. Absolutely. So my hope is that people will read it, and, and, and by the way, for us, for Americans who read it, I hope we read it and start thinking about the analogies in our own society, right? The way that these things don't happen overnight, right? There are people dedicated to, if you put it in our idiom, taking over the school boards, right? And, 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 um, and marginalized, and, and targeting the most marginalized and terrified populations in the country. Let's say trans people, right? and making them the scapegoat of hatred and turning the culture wars against the most vulnerable and marginal people, of, of taking things that we dismiss as ridiculous like woke and cancel culture and turning them into cudgels with which they terrify and, and, uh, and batter people. Like, that's what happened in Israel, right? The first thing that happened, you mentioned liberal, right? So do you know what a bad word in Israel is now? Human rights organizations, Yep. right? Maybe not so much anymore, but for much of the last decade, that was like saying, I don't know, liberal, you know, in, in, in America. Like, and, and it was known that they were all Bogadim. They were traitors. They were funded by George Soros and the, and, the, and the Europeans. By the way, Israel's biggest trading partner is the EU, so that's ironic. But, um, but uh, what I hope is that people could read that, that chapter and see how a country that was always a flawed democracy, right? You know, there's a, there's a, there are people who say that because... Um, so large swaths of Israel were until the middle of 1966, from 48, May 48 till 66, um, large swaths of Israel were under a sense of a sort of military governance. I'll give you one guess as to who the, what the population was that lived in those parts of Israel, right? They, they never said Arab citizens will live under military governance. They said the Triangle, that's an area in central Israel, the, the parts of the Galilee, parts of the Negev, and, and finally, in the middle of 1966, they, they, they eradicated that. They threw it out, and everyone was totally equal, truly equal under the law. Not until 1966. And then what happened in June 1967, the Six-Day War in Israel uh, begins the occupation, which is now 56 years old. So some say there were basically six or seven months in which Israel was a total democracy. So, so but, but even, even there, there was, um, there, there, there was a, a sort of, uh, one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back, dance, as Israel kind of moved fitfully um, or tried to move towards a better version and, and vision of itself. And that really stopped. That trajectory stopped with the assassination of Rabin and with the rise of what I call the new Israeli right, this coalition of, uh, well, it's the coalition that you see today, ethno-nationalists and ultra-nationalists, radical settlers who believe that the, um, that the God-given obligation of the Jewish people is to settle the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria, as they call it, the West Bank or the occupied territories, and to ultimately displace the Palestinians living there, uh, and ultra-Orthodox, uh, who are the fastest growing demographic group in the state of Israel. That's who is in charge of the country. Whose main now. thing is they just don't want to serve in the military. Yeah, and they, and they, want, they don't want to be, ta they want to be able, free to sort of study Torah and not join the workforce. And they want tax money to go to their yeshiva. Yeah, yeah. now, when you, when you ask, like, and then you put in the, into the mix Mr. Netanyahu facing three indictments and Mr. Derry, the leader of the Shas party, ultra-Orthodox Mizrahi party. Criminal. 
who was barred from serving by the Supreme Court uh, because he was a, a felon who served jail time and you have to wait seven years, right? And so he's- Tax fraud. For tax fraud. Yeah. So you, you see three things that, um, that you see three sec, uh, sec, uh, co parts of the coalition who have a common goal, right? And, and who's in the way of their, of, uh, they wanna realize BB and Derry don't wanna go to jail or they wanna serve in Derry's case. The ultra-Orthodox don't wanna be told that they have to serve in the army or that they have to participate in Israeli society. And uh, the ultra-nationalist, ethno-Jewish supremacist settler movement doesn't want anyone telling them that you can't go back to the settlement or you can't annex or you can't do this. Who's the one check on all of those impulses? Supreme Court. Supreme Court, the only one. And that brings us back to the beginning of the conversation. So th that's sort of like, if I could have written a f another chapter in the book, it would have been basically what I just said. And, and so I think the book can get you to the place where you see why those factors and those factions of the coalition see the court and the judiciary as the ultimate enemy of everything that is wrong with Israel today. Absolutely. Um, in the second half, you really dive into <laughs> not just uh, issues and controversies that are of interest to you, but really two of the most uh, contentious words and issues around Israel, um, anti-Semitism and apartheid, which you call the two A words. Um, other than just wanting to be a uh, rabble rouser or wanting to uh, poke uh, perhaps one of the most you know, significantly difficult concepts, um, what, what motivated you to want to kind of address those so, so blatantly and so in depth? You know, it was actually the total opposite impulse. It, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to sometimes be a rabble rouser and poke things, but that's not at all, I wanted to do the opposite. Um, I, I, I wrote about those two things because those are two of the things that I saw sort of uh, as, as most corrosive and, cor and corrupting in, a, in, in, in reasonable conversation. And I felt like th that, that I needed to unpack them for the reader. You know, and I, look, again, as I said, I didn't write the book for young people, but I did not write the book for young people. And I thought about my daughters. And I thought, like, what do you do when you're confronted with people who say Israel's an apartheid state or people who say calling Israel an apartheid state is anti-Semitism? So what I always do when I'm in a situation, I mean, you know my, 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 um, my MO from our conversation about Zionism. I want to unpack it and find out what people really mean. And so, in the, so that's why I wrote those chapters, um, not to poke anyone, but because, it, like, I didn't bring those, those words into the conversation. Those words are in the conversation. Everyone in the room knows that those are things that are part of the conversation. So I wanted to sort of unpack them and break them down. And you know, the great thing about writing a book and running the New Israel Fund is that if people don't like what I say, that's fine, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> I don't care. But um, so. I wonder what that's like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, man. Um, <laughs> When I left the Jewish Federation uh, <laughs> and I went to NIF and NIF came under attack, a reporter for a newspaper, The Forward, called me up and, and NIF was under attack and she said, well, I spoke with one of your former board members at the Federation and she said truly sympathetically, she said, poor Danny, that's what they called me, sweet. She said, out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> and the reporter said, is that how you feel? And I said, no, not at all, because in the challenging you know, think, the challenging episodes of the Federation where I had to sort of say, we're not gonna defund the Jewish Film Festival because they had a movie you didn't like. We're not gonna defund <laughs> Berkeley Hillel because they said that even non-Zionist students are welcome at the Shabbat table. We're not gonna do any of those things. And people would get furious. Um, and the board was like, yeah, yeah, you go deal with that, Danny. Um, <laughs> and I was all alone. And I said, here, with NIF, it's me and, and 100,000 of my closest friends. So, so I, I feel you, brother. Um, <laughs> So when it so look when it comes to apartheid, you know the, the, the that was in a way the easiest chapter to write in the book. Mm. Just you know because it, it happened to be because that was one of the that was a thing I say all the time. I just transposed the thing that I've said for years. By the way, what I've said for years it's pretty quick. I can say it quickly, right? Like people always ask, you know, accused or ask, is Israel an apartheid state? And what I what my answer has always been, with a caveat that I was able to put in the book because we were. We, we delayed going to print a couple times, so I was able to address the caveat. <laughs> so what I always say is, look, if you give me a group of intellectually honest, hardline critics of Israel, right, uh, and you let me take them up and down the length and breadth of the state of Israel within the green line, 
that is to say, within what they call the, you know, the 67 or 48 borders, which was the armistice line of the War of Israel's independence, which Palestinians refer to as the Nakba, their catastrophe. But, but when that war ended, the UN drew a green line and they said, that is Israel, right? Uh, and then in 1967, Israel captured much, much more territory, including all the territory to the east of that green line. If you let me take those people up and down Israel proper within the green line, then they talk to Jews and Arab citizens and Mizrahim and Ashkenazim and secular and religious. They will see a country that, as I said earlier, is a flawed work in progress, a one step forward, sometimes two steps back democracy, trying to figure out how to... Uh, how to square being a Jewish homeland and an, a, and, a, and an open democracy for all of its citizens. Often with institutionalized, even formalized racism, and often with civil society in terms of organizations and people who are pushing back against that, right? By the way, like if, you, if you're an American, you understand what institutionalized racism and how you have to deal with it, what it looks like, right? So you, you'll see a country that does pass horrible, horrible laws like the nation state law, which essentially says to Arab citizens of Israel, you are second class citizens because only the Jewish people has the right to self-determination here. But you will see a Supreme Court with Arab justices on it. One of whom, by the way, sent the former president of Israel to jail for rape. Right? Yep. You will see that up until the last election cycle, the third largest party in the parliament was Ayman Oda's joint list. That's right. You will see uh, when the nation state law was passed, hundreds of thousands of Israelis come into the streets uh, to stand shoulder to shoulder with Druze and Arab citizens. In other words, you'll see a flawed place, but a place that is in no way, shape, or form a uh, uh, South African apartheid model. Right? It doesn't resemble the South African apartheid model for all of its many. It may resemble sometimes even Jim Crow America, but it doesn't look like apartheid. If you give me a similarly intellectually honest group of right-wing defenders of Israel, of the Israel always right crowd, and you let me take, if they're intellectually honest, and you let me- Those are two very important qualifications they are that you've been- For both of my camps. For both sides, That's right. exactly. It's maybe, uh, it may be a, um, an imaginary group. Um, and you let me take them up and down the length and breadth of the West Bank, and we meet with Palestinians, and we meet with settlers, and we meet with soldiers, and if they see the checkpoints that, that not only guard, uh, pal that not only uh, check Palestinians trying to enter Israel proper, but also regulate Palestinians when they wanna go from one Palestinian city to another one. When they see the infrastructure, some have called it a matrix of control, that Israel has built over the last 56 years, highways intended for, Israel, where Israeli license plates are allowed, but not Palestinian ones. Uh, bulldozed entrances to Palestinian villages so that they can't get out and access those roads. Tunnels, which allow Jewish settlers, right, who are living in numbers over 700,000 in the West Bank and in the areas around Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, which Israel unilaterally annexed, uh, and, and that, wasn't, that was, has not been recognized by even the Trump administration, right, if they see the inequitable distribution of land and building permits and energy and resources, if they see two systems of law where Israeli settlers living in a place that is not Israel are tried in Israeli civil courts and Palestinians are tried in military courts. If they see all of this, all of it based on an immutable characteristic of birth, right? The accident of whether you were born Jewish or whether you were born Palestinian. If they see the fact that um, Palestinians have extraordinarily limited uh, self-control or, or autonomy is too strong a word, in tiny holes of Swiss cheese in the West Bank area A, where 90% of the Palestinian, or 80% of the Palestinian population lives, but where it's about 6% of the land, and even then the IDF can come in whenever it wants to, as we've been reading, it has been doing. When you see all of that, you would be hard pressed to say that it doesn't resemble some of the more pernicious aspects of apartheid. So what I just did in maybe three and a half to four minutes is not a sound bite. And by the way, like, my, my favorite pull quote from an interview about the book was from the Toronto Star, and the whole pull quote was, my answer is not a soundbite. <laughs> so, so, so what do you do with that? As, as Talia Sasson, our former board chair, a state prosecutor of the state of Israel, once said when asked about whether Israel was an apartheid state, she said, whether, whether the occupation was tantamount to apartheid, she said, it's bad enough what it is without using inaccurate historical analogies. That's and a good answer. That has tended to be my answer. But here's the caveat. In the meantime, so there's the analogy to South Africa, which again, I'm arguing is totally, um, that fails within Israel, 
but does not fail when applied to the West Bank. And that's complicated because who controls the West Bank? It's the same country that is making the decision, right? So in one part of the territory they control, people are treated a certain way, equally, more or less, and another one, not equally. Like, that's a, that's a very fuzzy area. But what is less fuzzy is that a few years ago, starting with some NIF human, uh, supported human rights organizations, one, one of them called Yeshdin, a sober-minded, serious organization, um, which means there is a law, uh, in, in Hebrew there, uh, a legal operation that looks at the West Bank, they released a, a, a paper that was written by Israel's uh, uh, most highly regarded human rights attorney, a guy called Mikhail Svard, uh, in which Svard argued that uh, Israel was in violation of two treaties, one from the 80s, one from the 70s, that defined an international crime against humanity which was called apartheid. And it had three elements, right? Uh, a, a, a party in control of territory had to, um, had to elevate one population based on racial or ethnic or religious characteristics over another one. It needed to um, put in place systems to accommodate that, that um, elevation. It could be roads and tunnels and structures. It could be legal systems. And it needed to commit what the laws call inhumane acts in the, uh, in the perpetuation of that system. And they define them, collective punishment, such as the destruction of homes of families of people related to terrorists, or uh, prohibitions on freedom of assembly and freedom of speech, prohibitions on freedom of movement. And Svard wrote, we check all those boxes when it comes to what we are doing in the West Bank, and therefore, we would hold that Israel is in violation of the international uh, 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 laws against the crime defined as apartheid. Would it have been easier for everyone if the crime had been defined as something else, if there was another name? No doubt. But when they came up with that crime, they weren't thinking specifically about Israel in 1973, and you know, and when the Hague, when the Treaty of Rome was signed in the 80s. So that caveat uh, is that there is the analogy, which, as Talia says, is imperfect, and then there is a crime that's called apartheid. And I agree with Sfard that Israel is whatever you call that crime, Israel is doing that in the West Bank. And that, as you know, that charge is picked up by other, perhaps less sober, human rights organizations. Um, and, and some human rights watch, again, this is what I'm about to say may elicit ups, upset in some of us, human rights watch essentially said what Yeshtin said. And they essentially said, yeah, we're not talking about Israel proper, we're talking about the West Bank, and, and that is the crime of apartheid. And Amnesty International said the whole thing is, a, is apartheid. But my point in writing The this, distinction is the intention of the organizations. Yeshtin had a different intention yeah, than human rights and by and Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree, yeah. and, and, and Human Rights Watch too, and I yeah. don't disagree, but I also would argue that like, you know, that controversy about what did they call it tends to distract from the real issue, which is who, who is doing it yeah. and why are they doing it. Yeah. So again, that's the not soundbite about apartheid, and that's why I wrote about it. I think it's super important for us to understand the nuance of this conversation when that word comes up. Because otherwise, it just becomes a, a cudgel or a, or a, or a weapon, um, when in fact, we actually have to try to understand. And you know, the answer, in my opinion, isn't to get furious and angry. It's to say, oh my gosh, you know, if we accept some of, if you, if you believe what I, if, if you agree with my um, analysis, um, or even if you don't, right, it's, my hope is for some cheshbon nefesh, yeah. some introspection. One answer would be the two-state solution. Is that dead? Well, I, uh, I don't know, but it doesn't have to be dead, right? The obstacle, like, let's be clear, it's millions of miles away. And it's millions of miles away for three basic reasons. Well, maybe it's the same reason. Nobody really wants it enough, right? The current government of Israel doesn't want it at all. Um, by the way, Yair Lapid was prime minister for 15 minutes, right, after Naftali Bennett uh, resigned and before the election. He is, since Ehud Olmert in 2008, he's the first Israeli prime minister who proudly said, I support a two-state solution, Yeah. right? Uh, Bennett and Netanyahu both said, I absolutely don't support it, even though it's the official policy of the state of Israel and the PA and the Arab League and the United Nations and the United States, States. right? So, and the EU. So the only people who seem to want it are the US and the EU, right? Um, the Palestinians are too weak and disorganized to be able to do anything about it. 
the Israeli government doesn't particularly want it, and much of the Arab world that always said that they wanted it so badly seems perfectly happy to make peace agreements with yeah. Israel as long as they don't officially annex. So the obstacle to a two-state solution is not a lack of political creativity, it's a lack of political, political will. will. Yeah. So I don't know if it's still possible. I do know that what are the alternatives, right? Um, Ben-Gurion emerged from self-imposed exile in, in 1967, he came to Jerusalem in September to speak at a think tank. And uh, by the way, this is a part of the book that freaks people out. And they're like, that couldn't have happened. And then they go look and it, it yeah. did happen. Um, Arthur, Arthur Hertzberg was actually one of the people who reported about this back in the day. And he said, I'll paraphrase, he said, amidst the euphoria and ecstasy, he said, look, we have to give it back. Not the old city of Jerusalem and not the Golan Heights. In that sense, the dude, the dude was a little prescient there. Yeah, definitely. Um, he said, but we have to give the rest back. Even if there's no one to give it to, you have to, you can't keep it. Because basically you won't be, if you want to be a democracy and a Jewish homeland and keep all the, you can't keep all the land. Yeah. And if you want to keep all the land and be a Jewish homeland, ultimately you'll force yourself not to be a democracy. Hello, that's what happened yesterday. Yeah. We stopped that one for a minute. Or if you keep all the land and you want to be a full democracy, eventually you probably won't be a Jewish homeland. So that was the original sort of argument for the two-state solution made by that left-wing traitor, the founder of the state of Israel. Yeah. Amos always said that it, it undermines the whole soul of the Jewish people if, if, they, if they keep the land. Um, Rabbi Spicer. Okay, you've been lingering. Can we pass some cards? Or do you have a card? Have, has anyone written a question? You've been too enthralled by what's been said here. <laughs> you put a Kanahara on it now. I, I know. <laughs> While we're doing that, um, what's the most surprising response you've gotten to the book? Um, my favorite response, I don't know if it's the most surprising response, See what I did there? Yeah, I did. Just answer the question I wanted. I understand. Um, it's pivoting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the book got a really nice review in the Sunday New York Times, which my mother, Ann Sokach, of course, like, I don't have to do anything else. <laughs> like, I gave her beautiful grandchildren and a New York Times. So, but it was a really good review, but mom was a little irritated because at the end of the review, the reviewer said, fairly, I think, he said, you know, it's a really good book, but at the end of the day, the author doesn't offer solutions, merely reasons for hope. <laughs> and I was like, guilty. And then a, a, a dude in a podcast I did in London, the guy said that the book, or maybe it was me, was irritatingly even-handed. And I thought, <laughs> so, and my publishers at Bloomsbury, they laughed and they were like, we should put that on the, you absolutely on the back should. of the paper. You absolutely so uh, I guess the, the biggest surprise, so to answer sincerely your question, it, it, I, I hope this doesn't sound glib because it really was the biggest surprise. I, I remember when my, um, when my publisher submitted the book to the Jewish Book Council. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. The Jewish Book Council is phenomenal. Only we could have come up with the Jewish Book Council. It, it basically is a nonprofit that exists to connect Jewish audiences with authors and books that they might be interested in. Like, it's the most Jewish thing I've I ever heard of I was just going to say, life. you can't get more Jewish than and that. And it's a nonprofit, so no one can even accuse them of you know, trying to get rich off this. That's not a get rich scheme. I love the Jewish Book Council. And, uh, but when my publisher said, we're going to submit your book to the Jewish Book Council, and you have to do like a two minute, it was Zoom in those days, speed date, where you get two minutes to pitch your book, and all these synagogues and, you know, and, uh, and JCCs and federations, and, and they, they, they subscribe, they, they are pay, dues paying members of the JBC, and then, you know, in front of a thousand people, you have to do your two minute pitch. Um, so when they said we want to submit the book, I said, look, the, the answer to the rhetorical question I posed in the title Thank of the you. book, can we talk about Israel, may well be, no, we cannot. And so the great surprise has been, we absolutely can. And there are many places, not in Seattle or San Francisco, right, but in Tulsa, or in uh, Fort Washington, or in St. Louis, where it'd be very difficult to invite the CEO of New Israel Fund to come and do a talk like this, but it's not hard to invite the author of a book like this to come and talk. And there is a huge hunger for it, and I have probably done over 100 book talks because of Zoom, 
silver lining of the horrible <laughs> pandemic, right? Yeah. And it, I mean, sometimes people don't agree, but there has never been any of them that have broken down into shouting and screaming. And so the answer to the question is yes, we can. And maybe if we get past the self-appointed gatekeepers of our community and we treat each other with respect and empathy, even if we really disagree, we can talk about Israel, and that's a, a really good thing, I think. And again, that is a profound Jewish value that perhaps if we can reclaim that in this crazy atmosphere that we're in, that might be a, an example for the wider culture. Yeah, like so, you said, that polarity, that's not, we're supposed to be able to do this. We are, uh, we are encouraged to do yeah. this. So, interesting question here. Is there validity, validity to the argument, and that's the argument made from those who want to do judi judicial reform, that some groups are underrepresented in the judiciary? Well, um, so if the question means are there, are there judges who, are there populations who aren't reflected in, in the judiciary? I think Probably the answer, more ideological, yeah. But right, yes, the answer yeah. I think would be no. As yeah. I said, there are Arab judges, there are Mizrahi judges, there are women. Um, so I think it's fair, there are religious, there are secular. So I think the judiciary is, is fairly well represented. But if the question is really um, about whether or not, so when we read the news, like if you read the Times, when they try, the New York Times, they try to sort of explain what's happening. They, they say the, the folks who were in favor of the judicial reform, I put that in air quotes because it's really not a reform. Yeah. It's an overhaul, yeah. right? Um, were upset because they feel that they have not been treated equally then, then, then I suppose if you feel that a ruling against your interests is, is an, an unequal uh, uh, ruling, then, then yeah. You know, I think a lot of people in this country would feel like the Supreme Court is not representative of us. I was I just going to say. a lot of people in this room. I was just going to say, that's, that's one of the things that they're looking at, I think. So, is it, they, they, Trump was successful in reshaping their Supreme Court in his image. That's right, and, they, and there's a, uh, a, a very disingenuous argument that the proponents in, Israelis, in Israel's coalition have made, which is, why are you so angry? This is just what America does. And my board member and dear friend, the woman who said, looks, I think I said this tonight, right? We're not Hungarians and we're not Poles. The woman who said that is a woman called Yael Sternhell, who, who wrote a piece that's, that's on Haaretz's website right now. By the way, if you're in this room, you should pay to get through the paywall at Haaretz because you care enough about Israel, and that is really the best way to keep track of what's happening on I the I agree ground. a thousand percent. Times of Israel is pretty good and it's free, but Haaretz is unparalleled. Yep. Um, uh, so so uh, Yael Sternhell wrote a fabulous piece in Haaretz that's there right now about the disingenuity of that argument, right? About the, this is what the Americans did. And, and she basically, I'll regal I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it for you in a few seconds. One, she says, America has sets of checks and balances that we don't have here in Israel. Bicameral legislature. Bicameral legislature, Huge written difference. constitution, bill of rights, federalism, so that federal law has limits, and then state law can, can push back against it. Um, and she says, uh, so, and we don't have any of those things in Israel. That's right. And then she goes, and also, the American model is not a good one, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and so here's an irony. Israel has a really good judicial selection uh, a process right now, it, it, because it leaves it to um, the coalition and the opposition are represented in the selection committee, but mostly it's jurists. It's people who understand the law, who know the law. Um, you know, the problem that, that, to put it bluntly, the right wing has with the judiciary is that the judiciary has been a check on some of the things that, the, that I explained those three components of the right wing have wanted to do, That's right. all of which require Israel to be a less Western style democracy than it is now to be done successfully. And so that's where the rage comes. They've been, they, you know, now it's not to say that there aren't problems with the judiciary. There are, they're just not the ones that these laws are meant to address, right? That, for example, there are not nearly enough judges in Israel. People always say to me, they're outraged. How could Netanyahu's trials be taking, as if I can't do anything about it, but like, but it's been three years now. Well, there is a terrible crisis of a lack of judges and, and access to courts in Israel. So there are real things that have to happen to change, that have to change in Israel. And you, you could, I suppose, make an argument that, um, that uh, we probably don't have time to get into this, but because there's no constitution in Israel, basic laws, which hold constitutional status, sort of um, are extra special laws but it doesn't take any different process to get a basic law in place than it does to get a, a, a regular law in place. And so there's an issue there. It's about, not ratifying an amendment to the Constitution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I guess you could argue that 
the high court shouldn't have the ability to just weigh in on a basic law, but the counter argument would be, well, then make the basic law something that's harder to weigh in on. Yeah. Don't, don't hamstring the court. So I guess my, my point is an answer to the question. I don't believe that the criticisms that we hear of the court from the coalition are, um, I don't want to say legitimate. I, I don't think, I think that they are the product of people who, have, who don't like the way the court is ruled, not because of politics or ideology, uh, but because their particular agenda has been thwarted by the court, which says you're overreaching. Wonderful. So here's a wonderful plug. In addition to donating to NIF, which I hope you all do, uh, what can U.S. Jews do? And this is a much broader kind of existential question. What can we do to encourage democracy and progressivism in Israel? Um, and this really gets to the heart of what is the role of world Jewry and American Jewry in Israel. When, it, when, it, when it's convenient for Netanyahu and others to say we're a sovereign nation, stay out of it, it's convenient. When Netanyahu and others say we're the center of Jewish life, the world, and we reflect you know, Judaism to the rest of the world, you know, that's, it, you know, that's convenient for them in that sense. Um, what can we do from here, and what, what, are, what should we be empowered to do to impact what's going on in Israel? Um, David Ben-Gurion once said about Ariel Sharon, Arik Sharon, he said, Arik Sharon, when he, when he was still a general, he said, he, he could have a great future if he wasn't such a compulsive liar, right? <laughs> and even Mr. Netanyahu's closest associates would not argue that, um, that he is consistent in his beliefs uh, and avoids you know, um, saying whatever he wants to say at the moment to suit himself. Because the same guy who said, don't butt into our business, is a guy who a couple of years ago said, uh, I am not just the prime minister of Israel, I am the leader exactly. of the Jewish world. Exactly. Well, guess what? If you are the leader of the Jewish world, then you're gonna have to listen to us Jews in the world when we talk to you. You don't get to have both of those things. Now, we can leave aside the unique relationship between the diaspora and Israel and how since the earliest moments of the Zionist enterprise, it was something of a partnership with a clearly senior partner in Israel since the establishment of the state. And we can leave aside the question of whether, uh, you know, the diaspora affairs minister, a real piece of work, um, he thinks that, that reforming conservative Judaism, even though he comes from parents who were conservative Jews, are illegitimate forms of Judaism. Yep. But he said to the Israeli ambassador, uh, you should butt out of our business. The ambassador said to me, uh, he was amused by this. When I was in Israel a couple weeks ago, he kind of smiled and he raised an eyebrow. And he's a Midwesterner, you know, laconic. And he said, really? He said, I, said, I, he said, I don't know who that guy is. Never heard of him before. But he said, I, I said to him, you sure? You sure you want us to butt out with that UN veto, those F-16s, you know, and that missile defense system, and that $30 billion of aid? You sure? Um, leaving all that aside, what can we do? I, I honestly think you are doing it. We are doing it, right? Not that we should be complacent. You know, there are, how many of you have gone to the, the unacceptable um, rallies in Seattle. Okay, so a bunch of you. I heard certain people on this podium spoke at them recently, on this bima. So uh, there are organizers, is Israeli expats have been organizing um, in parallel with NIF and a bunch of our partner organizations, uh, organizations like J Street, Americans for Peace Now, Trua, which is a rabbinic human rights organization. We have a coalition called PIN, the Progressive Israel Network. And together with Unacceptable, we have been organizing protests all over the country um, where people have come out to show support for the people on the street in Israel. And that's happened in Berlin and in London and in Paris and in, and in Cape Town and in places all over the world. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. So one thing we can do is literally show up with our feet and be there um, because it means the world to Israelis. When I was at the protest a couple of weeks ago, the first non-Israeli speaker ever to speak on the main stage in Tel Aviv when, uh, uh, spoke, and, and it was Rabbi Rick Jacobs, the president of the U Union of Reform Judaism, uh, the largest Jewish organization in the world outside of Israel, and a former NIF board member, I am very proud to say. And Rick Jacobs said, in really good Hebrew, uh, he said, I want you to understand that we, the Jewish community outside of Israel, are standing with you in the streets. You are our Israel. And I think that that is so important for us to convey. People went crazy when they heard it in that crowd of hundreds of thousands of people. So we can show up. 
the second thing we can do, and I'm speaking as a private citizen now, not as the head of NIF. Um, as the head of NIF, you should definitely support New Israel Fund. We are the <laughs> engine of support for all of those amazing organizations that, that organized the first mass protest. They're, we're not organizing them now. They've gone way mainstream, which is truly awesome to see. But NIF is still working to organize to make sure that Palestinian citizens of Israel are represented and feel safe to show up at those protests. And we're working to make sure that LGBTQ folks are able to show up at that protest and that folks, Ethiopians and folks on the physical periphery, the geographic periphery are, but you know, there are protests now in, in, in Beersheba, in, in, uh, in, in Ashkelon, in Ashdod. These are not places where, these are Likud strongholds yeah. where all kinds of people, left, right, and center are coming out. So, so you can support NIF, which is the engine of civil society in Israel. And then finally, without my NIF kippah on, you know, <laughs> what I will do as citizen Daniel I'm gonna support President Biden, and I'm gonna support the senators who are speaking out and saying, uh, hey, caring about Israel and supporting Israel does not mean writing a blank check, right? It doesn't mean saying everything you do is okay. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. Yeah, Tom Friedman said, if good friends take the keys away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he stole that from me. Did he? Okay. <laughs> I can't prove it. <laughs> uh, by the way, Tom Friedman is another good supporter of the New Israel Fund. Um, Good piece in the Times this morning, if you got a chance to yeah. read it, really good. So those are the three things I think we can do. Yeah. Um, one question here that kind of points to a, a larger existential question. You, you, you mentioned this a little bit, and maybe it's beyond the scope of what we can talk about. But um, the notion of Israel being a Jewish state in a democracy, um, in some ways that seems oxymoronic, especially if you take it to its logical implications. If Israel is to maintain its Jewish character, in some ways, it needs to focus on the Jewish population. If it's going to be a true, pure democracy, demographically, Jews will be outnumbered, and it will eventually not be. If it is a single, a single state, a binational state, it will no longer be a Jewish state. Doesn't the world need a Jewish state, and not just one that started out as one, but then eventually becomes a, a binational democracy in the Middle East? So you, I think that question sure goes to the heart of the matter and is, is beautifully stated, right, from a place of real inquiry and, and even maybe a little bit of anguish. My feeling is the, the founders of the state of Israel, kind of like our founders, bequeathed that country with an imperfect uh, um, blueprint. Theirs, unlike ours, holds no um, legal weight. It doesn't have any kind of constitutional primacy. It's just their... The, the, the Megillah Tatzmaut, the, 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 the Declaration of Independence. And in it, it says, Israel has to be a place for the ingathering of the exiles, right? A place, a Jewish homeland where Jews persecuted for millennia can be free and safe. And Israel has to be a totally equal society. It never says democratic, interestingly. Uh, a totally equal society for all of its members, regardless of race, religion. Get this, 1948, sex, they write. Gender, too. Again, people think it can't be. Well, go back and look. It says it. So it's kind of, an, kind of a, a, a beautiful and very ambiguous right, um, birthright that they have, no pun intended. Um, and nobody has ever defined what a Jewish state means. And so for me, I find um, creativity, hope, and possibility in the, um, in the fact that despite the people who will claim that a Jewish state has to be this, or, 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 or it can't be that, or democracy has to be this, or it can't be that. Creative solutions have been found uh, you know, for time immemorial. Right? Uh, if you go to Switzerland, you see a country that has figured out, you know, it's funny, because we think of Switzerland as the most beautiful, peaceful, rich, boring little country in the world. But when you think about it for a second, it's made up of Germans, Italians, and French. For a thousand years, those people were slaughtering each other in the worst conflagration in human history, right? You know, when you get to World War II, but, but in the thousand years leading up to it. And now they coexist in the EU, but for 500 years, they got along perfectly peacefully in Switzerland. So the idea that groups, I mean, like, it's hard for us to think, well, they're just Italians and French and, and, and Germans. They've never hated each other like Jews and Palestinians. Come on, right? Like, 
that that is a myopia of the moment, yeah. and it ignores an, a, a history. So, so I guess I find hope in creativity and possibility. And you know, what we think of a Jewish state as being right now might not be where the final sort of answer to this this conflict and this challenge is. Um, I don't know, but but because there's no single definition that we're forced to accept about that. Um, I think that our task is to support those Israelis who are wrestling with that conundrum, not the ones who sort of reject that birthright, um, but rather the ones who are trying to figure out how you can have those things. And I, I'll, I'll, last thing I'll say about that is I had an incredibly moving conversation with a guy called Hassan Jabarin, who runs uh, an NIF grantee organization called Adala, which means justice in Hebrew, which is Israel's it's kind of like the NAACP, Arabic. sorry, in Arabic, um, thank you. <laughs> it's like the NAACP LDF of Israel. It's like a, the largest Arab civil rights organization in Israel. And by the way, they represent Jews sometimes too, um, but they're really out to, to, um, to go to the courts to achieve equality for Israeli Arab citizens. And he once, you know, we had this, he's a really smart guy. And, and you know, is, do you think Hassan Jabrin is Zionist? back to our Z conversation, of course not. He just wants to be an equal citizen in his own country. But he said to me, you know, he said, for me, the law of return is very difficult to swallow. That you, Daniel, could decide today to become a citizen of this country and you would immediately be able to become one. And not only would you be able to become one in the way that my cousin in America could never do, uh, but, but really, even if we had the same rights in paper, you would have a level of privilege that I will never have. And he said, and I know for you, Daniel, we know each other, Hassan and I, that the law of return is like legislative poetry, an answer to the Holocaust and persecution. And he said, you know what, though? In the context of a two-state solution, where there was a Palestine living right next to Israel, my country, I would stay in, my, in Haifa, in my country, but when there's a Palestine with a law of return for Palestinians, then I'll have no problem with Israel's law of return. And that, to me, was like a beautiful moment of hope. Yeah. On that note, um, Daniel Sokatch, everybody. Thank you. Before we go, Hannah, don't go anywhere. This is wonderful to hear from Daniel. It's wonderful to hear more about NIF, which is an incredible organization that you should all run out and donate to tomorrow. But I want Hannah to talk a little bit more. Some of you may not know what NIF is all about, and I want Hannah to share that. Hi, everyone. I, I promise to be very quick. Um, first of all, thank you to our speaker, my boss, Daniel Sokach. <laughs> to Rabbi Wiener, to Rabbi Spizer, to the entire De Hirsch team, and to all of our many co-sponsors. There were seven shoals, at uh, seven organizations. Rabbi Kate Spizer. Over there. Rabbi Kate Spizer. <laughs> uh, my name's Hannah Barg. I am the regional director for the New Israel Fund in Seattle. Um, I work with the Seattle Regional Council. Some of you are still in the room. Maybe you can wave your hand or maybe folks went home. There's a few in the back. <laughs> um, to, to grow our presence in the region, to bring our grantees here, to introduce activists um, and connect them to progressive folks here in the US. Um, and yeah, if this is your first time hearing about NIF, please learn more. Come find me afterwards. There are so many ways to get involved. Um, and yeah, if you wanna be part of this pro-democracy pro pushback in this current moment, I hope you'll consider uh, joining the NIF family. I will send an email after this to everybody. You can join our email list, uh, come to future events, and unrelated to NIF, but related to what you spoke about, I hope you'll attend the unacceptable rallies every Sunday um, at 10 a.m., I believe. Bellevue Square. Bellevue Square. Um, while we may not be able to Bellevue Square Park. Yes. Bellevue Square Park. Park. <laughs> While we may not be able to be in Tel Aviv in March, we can stand in solidarity with those um, who are. So thank you so much. Daniel will be signing books in, out there. And yes, please come talk to us. And thank you. Have a wonderful night. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>